The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Chapter 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodward Pine. Chapter 9. Plan for Attaining Moral Perfection. It was about this time I conceived the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. I wished to live without committing any fault at any time. I would conquer all that either natural inclination, custom, or company might lead me into. As I knew, or thought I knew, what was right and wrong, I did not see why I might not always do the one and avoid the other but I soon found that I had undertaken a task more difficult than I had imagined. While my care was employed in guarding against one fault, I was often surprised by another. Habit took the advantage of inattention. Inclination was sometimes too strong for reason. I concluded at length that the mere speculative conviction that it was our interest to be completely virtuous was not sufficient to prevent our slipping and that the contrary habits must be broken, and good ones acquired and established, before we can have any dependence on a steady, uniform, vicissitude of conduct. For this purpose I therefore contrived the following method. In the various enumerations of the moral virtues I had met with in my reading, I found the catalogue more or less numerous, as different writers included more or fewer ideas, under the same name. Temperance, for example, was by some confined to eating and drinking, while by others it was extended to mean the moderating every other pleasure, appetite, inclination, or passion, bodily or mental, even to our avarice and ambition. I proposed to myself, for the sake of clearness, to use rather more names, and fewer ideas annexed to each, than a few names with more ideas, and I included under thirteen names of virtues all that at that time occurred to me as necessary or desirable, and I annexed to each a short precept which fully expressed the extent I gave to its meaning. These names of virtues, with their precepts, were 1. Temperance. Eat not to dullness, drink not to elevation. 2. Silence. Speak not but what may benefit others or yourself. Avoid trifling conversation. 3. Order. Let all your things have their place. Let each part of your business have its time. 4. Resolution. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. 5. Frugality. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself i.e. waste nothing. 6. Industry. Lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. 7. Sincerity. Use no hurtful deceit. Think innocently and justly. And, if you speak, speak accordingly. 8. Justice. Wrong done by doing injuries, or omitting the benefits that are your duty. 9. Moderation. Avoid extremes. Forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. 10. Cleanliness. Tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation. 11. Tranquility. Be not disturbed at trifles or at accidents common or unavoidable. 12. Chastity. 13. Humility. Imitate Jesus and Socrates. My intention being to acquire the habitude of all these virtues, I judged it would be well not to distract my attention by attempting the whole at once, but to fix it on one of them at a time, and when I should be master of that, then to proceed to another, and so on, till I should have gone through the thirteen, and as the previous acquisition of some might facilitate the acquisition of certain others, I arranged them with that in view, as they stand above. Temperance first, as it tends to produce that coolness and clearness of head which is so necessary 
when constant vigilance has to be kept up and guard maintained against the unremitting attraction of ancient habits and the force of perpetual temptations this being acquired and established silence would be more easy and my desire being to gain knowledge at the same time that i improved in virtue and considering that in conversation it was obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue and therefore wishing to break the habit i was getting into of prattling punning and joking which only made me acceptable to trifling company i gave silence the second place this and the next order i expected would allow me more time for attending to my project and my studies resolution once become habitual would keep me firm in my endeavours to obtain all the subsequent virtues frugality and industry freeing me from my remaining debt and producing affluence and independence would make more easily the practice of sincerity and justice etc etc conceiving then that agreeably to the advice of pythagoras in his golden verses daily examination would be necessary i contrived the following method for conducting that examination i made a little book in which i allotted a page for each of the virtues i ruled each page with red ink so as to have seven columns one for each day of the week marking each column with a letter for the day i crossed these columns with thirteen red lines marking the beginning of each line with the first letter of one of the virtues on which line and in its proper column i might mark by a little black spot every fault i found upon examination to have been committed respecting that virtue upon that day footnote pythagoras was a famous greek philosopher who lived about five eighty two to five hundred b c the golden verses here ascribed to him are probably of later origin the time which he recommends for this work is about even or bedtime that we may conclude the action of the day with the judgment of conscience making the examination of our convention an evening song to god End of footnote. i determined to give a week's strict attention to each of the virtues successively thus in the first week my great guard was to avoid every the least offence against temperance leaving the other virtues to their ordinary chance only marking every evening the faults of the day thus if in the first week i could keep my first line marked t clear of spots i supposed the habit of that virtue so much strengthened and its opposite weakened that i might venture extending my attention to include the next and for the following week keep both lines clear of spots proceeding thus to the last i would go through a course complete in thirteen weeks and four courses in a year and like him who having a garden to weed does not attempt to eradicate all the bad herbs at once which would exceed his reach and his strength but works on one of the beds at a time and having accomplished the first proceeds to a second so i should have i hoped the encouraging pleasure of seeing on my pages the progress i made in virtue by clearing successively my lines of their spots till at the end by a number of courses i should be happy in viewing a clean book after a thirteen weeks daily examination this my little book had for its motto these lines from addison's cato here will i hold if there is a power above us and that there is all nature cries aloud through all her works he must delight in virtue and that which he delights in must be happy another from cicero o philosophy guide of life o searcher out of virtue and exterminator of vice one day spent well and in accordance with thy precepts is worth an immortality of sin tusculian inquiries book five another of the proverbs of solomon speaking of wisdom or virtue length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honour her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace 
and conceiving God to be the fountain of wisdom, I thought it right and necessary to solicit his assistance for obtaining it to this end. I formed the following little prayer, which was prefixed to my tables of examination for daily use. O powerful goodness, bountiful Father, merciful guide, increase in me that wisdom which discovers my truest interest, strengthen my resolution to perform what that wisdom dictates, accept my kind offices to thy other children as the only return in my power for thy continual favours to me. I used also sometimes a little prayer which I took from Thompson's poems, viz. Father of light and life, thou good supreme, O teach me what is good, teach me thyself. Save me from folly, vanity, and vice, from every low pursuit, and fill my soul with knowledge, conscious peace, and virtue pure, sacred, substantial, never-fading bliss. The precept of order, requiring that every part of my business should have its allotted time, one page of my little book contained the following scheme employed for the twenty-four hours of a natural day. 5. Rise, wash, and address. 6. Powerful goodness. Contrive day's business and take the resolution of the day. 7. Prosecute the present study and breakfast. The morning question. What good shall I do this day? 9. Work. 12. Noon. Read or overlook my accounts and at dine. 3. Work evening six put things in their places supper music or diversion or conversation evening question what good have i done to-day nine examination of the day night ten sleep i entered upon the execution of this plan for self-examination and continued it with occasional intermissions for some time i was surprised to find myself so much fuller of faults than i had imagined but I had the satisfaction of seeing them diminish. To avoid the trouble of renewing now and then my little book, which, by scraping out the marks on the paper of old faults to make room for new ones in a new course, became full of holes, I transferred my tables and precepts to the ivory leaves of a memorandum book, on which the lines were drawn with red ink, that made a durable stain, and on those lines I marked my faults with a black lead pencil which marks I could easily wipe out with a wet sponge. After a while I went through one course only in a year, and afterward only one in several years, till at length I omitted them entirely, being employed in voyages and business abroad, with a multiplicity of affairs that interfered, but I always carried my little book with me. My scheme of order gave me the most trouble, and I found that, though it might be practicable or a man's business was such as to leave him the disposition of his time, that of a journeyman printer, for instance, it was not possible to be exactly observed by a master, who must mix with the world, and often receive people of business at their own hour, order, too, with regard to places for things, papers, etc., I found extremely difficult to acquire. I had not been early accustomed to it, and, having an exceeding good memory, I was not so sensible of the inconvenience attending want of method. This article, therefore, cost me so much painful attention, and my faults in it vexed me so much, and I made so little progress in amendment, and had such frequent relapses, that I was almost ready to give up the attempt, and content myself with a faulty character in that respect, like the man who, in buying an axe for a smith, my neighbor desired to have the whole of its surface as bright as the edge. The smith consented to grind it bright for him, if he would turn the wheel. He turned while the smith pressed the broad face of the axe hard and heavily on the stone, which made the turning of it very fatiguing. The man came every now and then from the wheel to see how the work went on, and at length would take his axe as it was without further grinding. No, said the smith, turn on, turn on, we shall have it bright by and by, as yet it is only speckled. Yes, says the man, but I think I like a speckled axe best. And I believe this may have been the case with many who, 
having, for want of some such means as I employed, found the difficulty of obtaining good and breaking bad habits in other points of vice and virtue, have given up the struggle and concluded that a speckled axe was best. For something that pretended to be reason was every now and then suggested to me that such extreme nicety as I exacted of myself might be a kind of foppery in morals, which, if it were known, it would make me ridiculous, that a perfect character might be attended with the inconvenience of being envied and hated, and that a benevolent man should allow a few faults in himself to keep his friends in continence. Footnote. Professor McMaster tells us that when Franklin was American agent in France, his lack of business order was a source of annoyance to his colleagues and friends. Strangers who came to see him were amazed to behold papers of the greatest importance scattered in the most careless way over the table and floor. End footnote. In truth I found myself incorrigible with respect to order, and now I am grown old and my memory bad, I feel very sensibly the want of it. But on the whole, though, I never arrived at the perfection I had been so ambitious of obtaining, but fell far short of it. Yet I was, by the endeavour, a better and a happier man than I otherwise should have been, if I had not attempted it, as those who aim at perfect writing by imitating the engraved copies, though they never reach the wished-for excellence of those copies, their hand is mended by the endeavour, and is tolerable while it continues fair and legible. It may be well my posterity should be informed that to this little artifice, with the blessing of God, their ancestor owed the constant felicity of his life down to his seventy-ninth year, in which this is written, What reverses may attend the remainder is in the hand of providence, but if they arrive, the reflection on past happiness enjoyed ought to help his bearing them with more resignation. To temperance he ascribes his long continued health, and what is still left to him of a good constitution, to industry and frugality, the early easiness of his circumstances and acquisition of his fortune, with all that knowledge that enabled him to be a useful citizen, and obtain for him some degree of reputation among the learned, sincerity and justice, the confidence of his country, and the honourable employs it conferred upon him, and to the joint influence of the whole mass of the virtues, even in the imperfect state he was able to acquire them, all that evenness of temper, and that cheerfulness in conversation, which makes his company still sought for, and agreeable even to his younger acquaintance. I hope, therefore, that some of my descendants may follow the example, and reap the benefit. Footnote. While there can be no question that Franklin's moral improvement and happiness were due to the practice of these virtues, yet most people will agree that we shall have to go back of his plan for the impelling motive to a virtuous life. Franklin's own suggestion that the scheme smacks of foppery in morals seems justified. Woodrow Wilson well puts it, Men do not take fire from such thoughts unless something deeper, which is missing here, shines through them. What may have seemed to the eighteenth century a system of morals seems to us nothing more vital than a collection of the precepts of good sense and sound conduct. What redeems it from pettiness in this book is the scope of power and of usefulness to be seen in Franklin himself, who set these standards up in all seriousness and candor for his own life. See Galatians chapter 5 for the Christian plan of moral perfection. End footnote. It will be remarked that though my scheme was not wholly without religion, there was in it no mark of any of the distinguishing tenets of any particular sect. I had purposely avoided them, for being fully persuaded of the utility and excellency of my method, and that it might be serviceable to people in all religions, and intending some time or other to publish it, I would not have anything in it that should prejudice any one of any sect against it. I proposed writing a little comment on each virtue, in which I 
would have shown the advantages of possessing it, and the mischiefs attending to its opposite vice, and I should have called my little book The Art of Virtue, because it would have shown the means and manner of obtaining virtue, which would have distinguished it from the mere exhortation to be good, that does not instruct and indicate the means, but is like the apostle's man of verbal charity, who only without showing to the naked and hungry how or where they might clothe or victual, extorted them to be fed and clothed. James chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 Footnote Nothing so likely to make a man's fortune as virtue. End footnote But it so happened that my intention of writing and publishing this comment was never fulfilled. I did indeed from time to time put down short hints of the sentiments, reasonings, etc., to be made use of in it, some of which I have still by me, but the necessary close attention to private business in the earlier part of my life, and public business sense, have occasioned my postponing it, for it being connected to my mind with a great and extensive project that required the whole man to execute, and which an unforeseen succession of employs prevented my attending to, it has hitherto remained unfinished. In this piece it was my design to explain and enforce this doctrine, that vicious actions are not hurtful because they are forbidden, but forbidden because they are hurtful. The nature of man alone considered that it was therefore every one's interest to be virtuous, who wished to be happy, even in this world, and I should, from this circumstance, there being always in the world a number of rich merchants, nobility, states, and princes, who have need of honest instruments for the management of their affairs, and such being so rare, have endeavoured to convince young persons that no qualities were so likely to make a poor man's fortune as those of probity and integrity. My list of virtues contained at first but twelve, but a Quaker friend, having kindly informed me that I was generally thought proud, that my pride showed itself frequently in conversation, that I was not content in being in the right when discussing any point, but was overbearing and rather insolent, of which he convinced me by mentioning several instances, I determined, endeavouring to cure myself, if I could, of this vice or folly among the rest, and I added humility to my list, giving an extensive meaning to the word. I cannot boast of much success in acquiring the reality of this virtue, but I had a good deal with regard to the appearance of it. I made it a rule to forbear all direct contradictions to the sentiments of others, and all positive assertion of my own. I even forbid myself agreeably to the old laws of our junto, the use of every word or expression in the language that imported a fixed opinion, such as certainly, undoubtedly, etc., and I adopted instead of them, I conceive, I apprehend, or I imagine, a thing to be so and so, or it so appears to me at present. When another asserted something that I thought an error, I denied myself the pleasure of contradicting him abruptly and of showing immediately some absurdity in his proposition, and in answering I began by observing that in certain cases or circumstances his opinion would be right, but in the present case there appeared or seemed to me some differences, etc. I soon found the advantage of this change in my manner. The conversations I engaged in went more pleasantly. The modest way in which I proposed my opinions procured them a readier reception and less contradictions. I had less mortifications when I was found to be in the wrong, and I more easily prevailed with others to give up their mistakes and join with me when I happened to be in the right. And this mode, which I am first put on with some violence to natural inclination, became at length so easy and so habitual to me that perhaps for these fifty years past no one has ever heard a dogmatical expression escape me, and to this habit, after my character of integrity, I think it principally owing that I had early so much weight with my fellow citizens when I proposed new institutions or alterations in the old, 
and so much influence in public councils when I became a member, for I was but a bad speaker, never eloquent, subject to much hesitation in my choice of words, hardly correct in language, and yet I generally carried my points. In reality there is, perhaps, no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Disguise it, struggle with it, beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases. It is still alive, and will every now and then peep out and show itself. You will see it, perhaps, often in this history, for, even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. Thus far, written at Passé, 1784. Footnote. I am now about to write at home, August, 1788, but cannot have the help expected from my papers, many of them being lost in the war. I have, however, found the following. This is a marginal memorandum. End of footnote. Having mentioned a great and extensive project which I had conceived, it seemed proper that some account should be here given of that project and its object. Its first rise in my mind appeared in the following little paper, accidentally preserved, viz. Observations on my reading history, in library, May 19, 1731. That the great affairs of the world, the wars, revolutions, etc., are carried on and effected by parties. That the view of these parties is their present general interest, or what they take to be such. That the different views of these different parties occasion all confusion. That while a party is carried on a general design, each man has his particular private interests in view. That as soon as a party has gained its general point, each member becomes intent upon his particular interest, which, thwarting others, breaks that party into divisions and occasions more confusion. That few in public affairs act from a mere view of good of their country, whatever they may pretend, and though their actions bring real good to their country, yet men primarily considered that their own and their country's interest was united, and did not act from a principle of benevolence. That few still, in public affairs, act with a view to the good of mankind. There seems to me at present to be great occasion for raising a united party for virtue, by forming the virtuous and good men of all nations into a regular body to be governed by suitable good and wise rules, which good and wise men may probably be more unanimous in their obedience to than common people are to common laws. I at present think that whoever attempts this aright, and is well qualified, cannot fail of pleasing God, and of meeting with success. B. F. Revolving this project in my mind, as to be undertaken hereafter when my circumstances should afford me the necessary leisure, I put down from time to time on pieces of paper such thoughts as occurred to me respecting it. Most of these are lost. But I found one purporting to be the substance of an intended creed, containing, as I thought, the essentials of every known religion, and being free of everything that might shock the professors of any religion. I expressed in these words, viz., that there is one God who made all things, that he governs the world by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped by adoration, prayer, and thanksgiving, but that the most acceptable service of God is doing good to man that the soul is immortal, and that God will certainly reward virtue and punish vice, either here or hereafter. My ideas at that time were, that the sect should be begun and spread at first among young and single men only, that each person to be initiated should not only declare his assent to such creed, but should have exercised himself with the thirteen weeks' examination and practice of the virtues, as in the before-mentioned model that the existence of such a society should be kept a secret till it was become considerable to prevent solicitations for the admission of improper persons, but that the members should each of them search among his acquaintances for ingenious, well-disposed youths, to whom, with prudent caution, the scheme should be gradually communicated, that the members should engage to afford their advice, assistance, and support to each other, 
in promoting one another's interests, businesses, and advancement in life, that for distinction we should be called the society of the free and easy, free as being by the general practice and habit of the virtues, free from the dominion of vice, and particularly by the practice of industry and frugality, free from debt, which exposes a man to confinement, and a species of slavery to his creditors. This is as much as I can now recollect of the project, except that I communicated it in parts to two young men, who adopted it with some enthusiasm, but my then narrow circumstances, and the necessity I was under of sticking close to my business, occasioned my postponing the further prosecution of it at that time, and my multifarious occupations, public and private, induced me to continue postponing, so that it has been omitted till I have no longer strength or activity left sufficient for such an enterprise, though I am still of opinion that it was a practicable scheme and might have been very useful by forming a great number of good citizens, and I was not discouraged by the seeming magnitude of the undertaking, as I have always thought that one man of tolerable abilities may work great changes and accomplish great affairs among mankind if he first forms a good plan and, cutting off all amusements or other employments that would divert his attention, makes the execution of that same plan his sole study and business. End of chapter 9